It's My Nerd World, a Star Wars show. Thank you so much for checking out this bonus uh, episode. I wanted to talk a bit more about The Acolyte, specifically Episode 3, ahead of this week's next uh, episode, which is why you're getting a bonus episode. We also have some listener feedback, so we're going to double up on the podcast uh, this week here on My Nerd World. I am your host, John Justice, and again, thank you so much for checking out the episode, and I'm going to get right to it. I've been consuming a lot of Star Wars commentary content ever since last week. I've been fascinated by the controversy around the Acolyte, and especially last week's episode, and I've been hearing from all different angles from the fandom menace those out there that really can't stand almost everything that Disney Star Wars has produced to those who really love the Acolyte to those who are simply waiting to see how this all plays out and I probably fall into that category more than I do those that are really hating completely on the show because I think there's something really really interesting that could potentially happen in this show now I have no idea if they're going to do this there's a possibility though that if the story takes a particular turn it'll be fascinating to see how the fandom reacts especially those that have been incredibly frustrated and upset over what the Alkalite has produced so far. As always, if you want to email talkshownerd at gmail.com, uh, you can also follow me on social media, uh, John Justice on X, J O N, at the My Nerd World on X as well. You can find me on Instagram there under both of those uh, too. I have a personal page, uh, The John Justice on Instagram. And uh, also the My Nerd World on Instagram. And the same thing rings true for TikTok. Although on TikTok, it's just um, at the uh, John Justice. So before I get to your listener feedback, let me talk a little bit more about, about the Acolyte. Now that I've had a chance to, uh, to sit on it and listen to all the controversy. I understand the level of frustration that people have. I also think that... There's a lot of jumping to conclusions taking place. And because of that, the criticism that's out there isn't as warranted. People don't want to go and complain about the way that the material has been handled. The the directing, uh, the acting, the writing, those are all things that I am totally game for in terms of criticism. The story elements that have been presented so far, while a lot of individuals find them to be doing that thing with my fingers, air quotes, cannon breaking, I'm not ready to go and jump to that conclusion yet because we haven't seen the entirety of the story. We don't know what the story is and whether or not there will be details provided that will offer up clarity to some of the biggest criticisms that this series has received. For example, a lot of people were complaining in episode number one when we first meet Rey on the ship and she's the mechanic, right? And I've heard some complaints about the the wordplay taking place. Instead of a mechanic, it's mechanic. Instead of uh, ice cream, they have spice cream. Okay, that's just Star Wars hokey stuff, and uh, you don't have to like it, but in terms of it destroying lore canon, you know, take it or leave it. It's kind of like Jar Jar Binks. But people were complaining about the fire that takes place on the ship and how there's no fire in space, and there were plenty of individuals on social media that were quick to go and point out that, well, we've seen fire in space going all the way back to Return of the Jedi. And George Lucas has even said before that he considers there to be atmosphere in his Star Wars galaxy far, far away, which actually helps me a little bit because one of the complaints that I've had, I don't have a ton of them, but one of the complaints that I've had about The Last Jedi was I didn't um, like how during the slow speed space chase, 
when um, the supremacy is lobbing their lasers at the escaping rebellion, the laser beams were arcing in space. It kind of drove me nuts. Uh, but when you consider there could be atmosphere in George Lucas's galaxy far, far away, suddenly now it's not breaking, you know, it's not taking me out of the movie. I'm like, okay, I can accept that, and I will use that as an excuse moving forward while I enjoy this film that I still quite enjoy. Now, to the more serious questions and canon breaking relating to episode three of The Acolyte. The idea that May and Osha were forced conceived and this how suddenly makes Anakin no longer special in his um, immaculate conception and therefore we're breaking canon if these witches can go and so easily create life and... With these twins, then it takes away what's unique and special of Anakin Skywalker. If these witches, another complaint along the same lines, can go and create these twins using the Force, then what about everybody else that's tried to before? They're suddenly more powerful than Palpatine. Um, I haven't heard anybody make this excuse, but if they wanted to, they could. You know, in The Mandalorian, you had Moff Gideon going through all the trouble that he went through to try to create Force-sensitive clones, in which case he just could have gotten these witches from long ago or learned how to do what they did, and he could have conceived these witches on their own. I've heard, or these, um, he could have conceived Force-sensitive, uh, you know, children to go and then create an army. I've heard a similar notion relating to why didn't Palpatine just do that and create a, you know, have a clone army of Force-sensitive warriors to create and all this. All this. Okay, so let me let me handle this. First off, we don't know the entirety of the details surrounding how the Force Witches did what they did. Now, let me say, as I said in last week's episode, the first 10 minutes of episode three, I didn't like at all. I thought the execution was bad. I thought the agenda was too on the nose. What they did specifically in the story didn't bother me nearly as much as the execution of it. It was goofy. It was cringeworthy. It just didn't work. Now, that being said, I do want to add something. Because in terms of the agenda, and I've even thought about this, relating to this coven of witches, we never found out how the Night Sisters ended up with their young warrior children. They were all female as well. That was never exposed and talked about, you know, in the Clone Wars, in the animated series. I'm certainly not in, in Ahsoka. Now, that being said, it, was, it, was, it wasn't addressed at all, so therefore it just wasn't an issue. What we saw within the Acolyte was certainly different. That was much more on the, on the nose. No allusions to the relations going on, and you can go and take it or leave it. Again, the execution during and the writing during the, the first eight minutes just wasn't good. Um, Mother Anna say when, when the twins are there and they're bickering in the background, fine, whatever, take it or leave it. It was goofy. But when she's talking about the thread, don't have an issue with that. If they want to call it something different, they can. When she's talking about how they utilize it in their view, that's their point of view. That's fine. I don't have a problem with, with that. I did have a problem with this discussion and and the the teaching that she had that seems contradictory to how they use the thread versus how the jedi use the thread and yet she's teaching the children how to go and use the thread the force in terms of defense and the force pushing none of that none of that worked to me but let me get back to the to, to the main issue here relating to the conception of the twins we don't know how they were conceived yet all we know is that the two mothers you know the one mother says i carried them mother anna say you know says i created them and the other mother who carried them says you know and if the jedi find out how we did it you know there's going to be trouble this is what i find most intriguing many people have pointed this out i don't think i mentioned it on the show but the show's creators leslie headland and others have said that they took inspiration from rashomon which of course shows the same story being told from different angles. Very similar to... Well, it's exactly what happened in The Last Jedi. 
relating to the altercation between Kylo Ren and Luke Skywalker. So we don't know the totality of all the events that took place during the you know, episode three of the Acolyte. We're probably going to see it from various ways. It's clear from various angles. It's clear that not everything has been told yet of the story. We don't know how the fire spread yet. That'll probably be explained. A lot of people are pointing to the fact that most of it looked like it was all brick. How is that catching on fire? How did it all erupt so quickly? That's all going to, I imagine, be fleshed out. If it's not, then you're looking at a completely different ball game. Once we see the story in its entirety, I think we'll all have a much different viewpoint on this good or or bad then there's a possibility here that they could do something very very interesting with this story now i'm convinced that the zipper face helmeted guy okay the sith of the story the guy with the red lightsaber he is going to be um revealed to not be the master he's going to be an apprentice people keep going back to commentary that leslie henland has done in the past specifically a star wars celebration where she talked about a master and an apprentice and then an acolyte so there's going to be a big bad probably revealed in the story at some point in time the witches and the witch coven are in my view at least so far in the absence of knowing specifically are utilizing more dark side power than they are anything else, much like the Night Sisters did. And this is intentional because I believe that what we're seeing, what we're going to see here is that neither side is really going to be the good or bad side in all of this. I think we're going to see that these witches were were tampering, or I should say delving into dark side force powers, thread powers. Uh, Mother Anna Say ends up unleashing that on Jedi um, Corbin. Right? Uh, Tor- Torben. Jedi Torben. Uh, Tobin. I keep getting his name wrong. Anyways, they used it on him when his eyes go black in that episode, right? And that's something, you know, to control another individual. That's dark side related. I talked about this on, on last week's show. The entire ascension ceremony, while it was cringeworthy, seemed more dark side than, than anything else. And we're clearly seeing that the Jedi had something to do with the death of of these witches i mean again the fact that they're being hunted by may would speak to that the fr- the fact that the one jedi after taking the vow of silence decides to go and commit suicide he's so broken over what had taken place here so i think at the end of the day we're going to see that neither side is going to come out looking like the heroes in this story and leslie headland the show's creator had said that she wants to show how the sith could potentially go and in, in uh, infiltrate inside the Jedi the Jedi ranks. But here's the cool the, the the interesting thing, the cool thing that they could actually do in the series which I think would go and break the fandom even further. Because if it's revealed that the the coven of witches conceived the twins through the dark side and we end up getting a further explanation and context to the speech that Palpatine gave to Anakin in Revenge of the Sith relating to Darth Plagueis, right? He could influence the midichlorians to create life. Now, I don't think what the witches did at the moment undermines how special Anakin was. From all that we know, Anakin... There was no father. The Force conceived Anakin as the one. Having these witches use the Force to create life is something completely different. They intentionally went and created life, as opposed to Anakin Skywalker and his having the Force create him as being the one. And we already have an example in terms of canon discussion of this with Palpatine in that speech in Revenge of the Sith, where he says, you know, Darth Pelagus could influence the midichlorians to create life. Okay, and he passed that on to his apprentice. If it turns out that what we see in the Acolyte is a riff off of that, is that the Coven of Witches, the two mothers, ended up using that which they learned from the Sith to go and create life and creating these twins 
To me, that would be a pretty amazing revelation. I'll go a step further. I don't think they're going to do this because typically when I'm analyzing a show and I'm thinking, boy, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome if it ended up being Pelagus was guiding all of this? That Pelagus was actually the one who passed off the knowledge to this coven of witches on how to go and create these twins using the dark side. That would be awesome. And something that I think the majority of the fandom, especially those that are most vocal against what they've been seeing so far, could actually get on board with. It's probably too much for me to ask that they would go and admit they were wrong at the end of the day. It doesn't take away from... How poor, in my opinion, the the writing, the staging, the direction of those first eight minutes of the show is. But without seeing everything in its entirety beyond the production elements that I just mentioned, it's really kind of unfair for the show to have been hammered the way that it has without all of the knowledge of what's going to happen. And that's the bummer part, in my opinion. It's been really interesting hearing all of the all of the controversies um, that have been surrounding the show, and I've been this is one of the few times I've actually been listening to some of the more vocal critics of Disney Star Wars because I've been interested in what they had to say, and I just I feel like there is there are too many assumptions being made without knowing the full context. It seems like Disney's doing a bit of damage control too because we've had. Uh, a number of articles that have come out, and this might have been part of the scheduled promotion of the episode, but we've had a number of articles that have come out in the wake of last week's episode, and it seems like they're trying to negate some of the negativity by offering up some further explanations. If If it were me, and I know that Disney will never do this, but if it were me... I think the smartest thing that Disney could do would be without addressing it's the reason why is say, hey, you know what? As uh, everybody's been talking about the Acolyte so much, we're going to go ahead and just release the rest of the series. And I think you could avoid a lot of backlash that way that is going to come over the course of the next, what, six weeks, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, we got nine episodes. Yeah, if they just went and dropped the rest of the episodes for everybody to go and watch it in its entirety and then come to their conclusion. Because right now, people will not be fair to this series any longer. And again, it's got its criticisms, legitimate criticisms. At the same time, it's got a lot of criticism that isn't warranted, in my opinion, because we don't know the whole story yet. Now, speaking to the damage control, this article came out just within a matter of days after last week's episode uh, dropped. I'm recording this on Monday. I'll have another episode later this week, probably on Thursday, where I'll share my thoughts of um, episode four. But the Acolyte creator and star explains the Witches flashback episode. There isn't one answer to it, says Leslie Headland of One Big Twist. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, got a, a little longer ago this uh, on this week's episode of The Acolyte when it traveled back 16 years in time to learn what led to the deadly split between the twins, Osha and May. On the planet Brendok, we saw how the Jedi interrupted a witch's coven ascension ceremony for the twins being led by one of their moms, Mother Anise. While May intentionally failed the test to see if she could be taken away and trained by the Order, Osha decided that she wanted to leave and become a Jedi. Afraid of losing her sister, May then either intentionally or accidentally, and I think we're going to get more context of this later, appeared to cause a fire, and that burned down the entire coven. May later seemed to plummet to her death, although she clearly survived. While Osho was rescued by Jedi Master Soul, who brought her back to Coruscant to begin both her training and her new life. The episode brings, or excuse me, answers many questions, including why May is out to kill the four Jedi that came to Brendok and set off the chain of events that took her sister and took the lives of the rest of the coven. And posing those questions before their before the answer is why creator Leslie Headland chose to not lead the series with the character's backstory. I did always think that if we're going to tell an origin story of these two characters, it would be a lot more interesting to dip in a later episode as opposed to starting with it. 
It just felt more dynamic and more interesting, she continues. As the writer's room and I developed the overall arc for season one, we started to get really influenced by Rashomon, as I mentioned, and the themes of the show started to rise to the top of duality, seeing things from different points of view. So it made sense to me that when you go back in time, there are a lot of different ways to interpret what happened. As for why that origin story takes place within a female witchcraft community, Hedlund says she took inspiration from the Night Sisters of Dathomir, seen on another Star Wars series. I was very inspired by the Night Sisters storyline and the Ventress storyline on Clone Wars when I was a budding writer, says Hedlund. So when I got a chance to make a show set in the Star Wars universe, it felt like, well, of course, I'm going to do my version of witches, so I'm just going to shoot my shot. Let me stop here real quick. Before we get any further into this. I'm not surprised the show has turned out the way that it has. If I'm a talk show host. So if I go and just for the sake of argument. Let's say that I am asked to go and fill in for Bill Maher's talk show. Right? I'm not saying that would ever happen in a million years. But let's just say for the sake of argument that it did. If I went on Bill Maher and hosted Bill Maher's show, it would still be Bill Maher's show. It would still have the same title. I would be on Bill Maher's stage. It would have the same uh, you know, graphics around it. It would be shot the same way. But it wouldn't be Bill Maher's opinion. It would be my opinion. It would change. This rings true for any show that I filled in on before. And actually, there's a bit of... Um, Ah, uh, what's the word I want to look for? When you go and fill in for for somebody, you don't want to violate the expectation of the listener of that show. You want to give your opinion, be you, but at the same time, you understand. So Bill Maher is probably not a good example. So if I'm going on a, a fellow talk show, radio talk show host show, it's going to have the same bumper music, the same intros, the same ads you would hear on the show, may even have the same producer's voice on there, but I'm going to be hosting it, so it's going to be different, even though I'm working within the same parameters, and it sounds just like that other show, except for my voice. The creation of Star Wars is is no different. George Lucas created the original trilogy, despite other directors coming in. He was still the one guiding the ship in all of this, approving all of this. It was one voice, same thing rings true, and more so for the prequel trilogy. He had more control, directed all, all three of them. In a post-George Lucas Disney purchasing Lucasfilm from George Lucas, we have something very different going on. You have content being made by Dave Filoni, arguably the closest in terms of being taught by George Lucas, the closest you're going to get to Lucas than any other creator on the show. And I feel like he does some of the best storytelling for that very reason. Jon Favreau creates The Mandalorian. Feels a lot like Star Wars in those first two seasons. But Jon Favreau went so far as to say that he was inspired by what George Lucas was inspired by. George Lucas was inspired by Kurosawa. The the writings of Joseph Campbell. um, Westerns. Uh, and so using those influences, he went and within the box of Star Wars created the Mandalorian, and in a lot of ways it felt like Star Wars. You bring in Tony Gilroy, who has no experience with Star Wars whatsoever to create and or, and you get something very different. He's more of an adult writer, content creator, director, filmmaker. And so you end up with something that is Star Wars, but from the point of view of Tony Gilroy. And the list goes on and on and on. Leslie Hedlund, given her background creating The Acolyte and what we've seen in terms of what's been injected into the show, this is Leslie Hedlund's Star Wars, inasmuch as The Last Jedi was Ryan Johnson's Star Wars. And I know that I'm not saying anything new I just wanted to add that to my commentary in that I'm not surprised we got what we got. Doesn't mean it's good or bad. There's bad parts of it. I've enjoyed the rest of it. I mentioned last week, as soon as the Jedi show up and we get past those first eight minutes of, of episode three, I quite, I quite, I quite enjoyed it. 
Um, and I really love those first two episodes. But this is Leslie Headland's version of Star Wars. All of this is to say that, in my opinion, they really do need Lucasfilm. Needs one voice to guide all of this stuff. And I, I know we're kind of getting there with Dave Filoni. He's gotten a promotion, received a promotion lately. Uh, and I know a lot of people point to Kathleen Kennedy being the one to make all these decisions. But I've enjoyed a lot of what has been created under the Disney banner. The Force Awakens um, and Episode 1 of The Mandalorian both were a movie and series that I felt was paying very close attention not to go and, ups uh, and upset fans. Um, the Force Awakens, J.J. Abrams specifically, you know, removed a lot of J.J. Abrams-esque things that he typically does to create a film that's not a reboot, but it is sort of a restart of the franchise, but has a lot of overlapping overlapping layers to what we saw in the original trilogy. Ryan Johnson comes in, does something dramatically different, does a Ryan Johnson Star Wars film, and of course, that movie is the most controversial Star Wars movie ever made. You get to the last you get to uh, The Rise of Skywalker, and as I've said many times, you kind of have this amalgam. You get J.J. Abrams, you get a little bit of what Ryan Johnson did, and then you have you know all of this within the Star Wars package. I quite enjoy it, but The Rise of Skywalker is a dr dramatically different film than The Force Awakens was, and I feel like J.J. Abrams came back and did that movie because they gave him the liberty to go and make something that was leaning in a little bit more to a J.J. Abrams film. Something very similar happened with J.J. Abrams when it comes to the 2010. It might have been came out in 2009. Um, but the, the Star Trek reboot. The second Star Trek movie is more J.J. Abrams. Now, the first Star Trek movie is definitely J.J. Abrams, but he also said he was creating his version of Star Wars before he did Star Wars. But you get into Into Darkness and... Those movies very much um, align, in my opinion, in terms of the differences. You know, The Force Awakens is to the first J.J. Abrams Star Wars movie as The Rise of Skywalker is to Into Darkness. I think that Lucasfilm would be well-to-do to have a Kevin Feige-esque individual at the helm that's calling all the shots to keep the content more consistent. All right. So let me get back to this Leslie Headland article now that I've deviated. The article goes on to say, but the acolyte, uh, the but the acolyte journey to witchdom is not a mere extension of what we've seen in other Star Wars shows, as Osha and May's background perfectly fits in with the women they have become. As the characters developed, it made a lot of sense that they would be at the center of a coven, said Hedlund, that the girls would be almost revealed not as children, but as the legacy of what their mother started. Hedlund also explains the coven's mant mantra, which just didn't land. The power of one, the power of two, the power of many. In our show, the Jedi have the power of many. I think their mother started as one, the girls are two, and she wants her legacy to be the power of many. So it was thought, um, so it was thought of as paying homage to the Clone Wars, but eventually became a story of a mom and her children in the way that our parents have particular expectations for us. And if Star Wars is anything, it's got a lot of parents and children and living up to our rejecting the legacy of those parents. And what are we to make of Anna Say's comment that she created the twins? This is where the damage control comes in. Hedlund will not say much, but does tease. If you keep watching the show, we do talk about that and explore that. I would say there isn't one answer to it. Some characters believe certain things, and other characters believe other things in terms of what she means by that. So you're going to have to watch and decide which side of that argument you're on. The creator spent a lot of time chatting with Turner Smith, who plays Anna Say, about the world of the witches... Um, perhaps too much time. We were in my trailer talking for way too long, laughs the star, and they were like, okay, we actually need you to go do some work. Turner Smith says she appreci appreciated the collaborative process with Hedlund and that her character and the witches represent something we've talked about. This is the gray area. If you were to think of the light side and the dark side as a binary that exists, the witches feel that they exist in the gray. Also, we're putting too much emphasis on the light and dark. I think it's more about power. So, getting back to the controversy surrounding the show. It shouldn't be this way, but it is this way. To present something that controversial, 
without immediately going and providing the context is a disservice to Star Wars fandom because of how Star Wars fandom is. Should Star Wars fandom be differently and more patient? Uh, Yeah, probably. I completely understand the criticism. It's cringy. It's strange. It doesn't land. It doesn't work like the Night Sisters did in the Clone Wars. It doesn't work like the Night Sisters do in Ahsoka. And again, the difference is there. I didn't see anybody complaining about the Night Sisters when they did their little incantation and ended up bringing Morgan Elsbeth into the fold. Maybe it was out there and I didn't see it, but certainly we didn't have this level of backlash. But to present something that is controversial like this and not have the wherewithal to realize that you guys are opening up a can of worms here is doing a disservice to the fandom. They could do something really cool. It would be rad if it turned out that Plagueis was behind all of this. And this story was the entry point into the first time that we see or we hear about. Maybe we're not even introduced. Maybe we just see him in shadow. But that these witches are dealing with the dark side. They created these twins because of the dark side. Again, intentionally, not an immaculate conception like Anakin. Now, there was a comic a while back that tried to allude to Palpatine was the one who ended up force creating Anakin. Um, That was never brought fully into canon. It was loosely sort of said in terms of a couple of frames of the, of the comic book, but even that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, you have this random child on a backwater planet with a mom and you just decide to pick this kid out of the blue. One more thing I want to add, too, is that in terms of questions we don't have answered. So we don't know exactly how they were conceived. There was a reason why the mother, just to recap, a reason why the mother who carried them said, if the Jedi find out how we did it, so clearly they don't think the Jedi are going to like how they did it, which, again, makes me believe they were using the dark side in intentionally going and creating the twins. Um, The Jedi that ends up committing suicide in Episode 2 ends up taking the blood of Osha to test her, assuming, midichlorian count. And whereas in The Phantom Menace, when Anakin asks Qui-Gon what he's doing, he talks about how what he's doing. In this case, he doesn't give Osha an answer. So there will be something revealed relating to her own midichlorian count in all of this. Maybe this is perhaps how the Jedi begin to figure out that, oh, these, you know, these two children are incredibly force sensitive and conceived by dark side forces. It remains to be seen. But I think that Disney did a disservice in this case of not releasing the entirety of the series all at once because now they're facing a backlash of unprecedented proportions and even if things are fleshed out and explained I don't think it'll be enough to quell it because again it's not being the production on it in terms of how some things are being handled is just not going to you know that that part of it can't be can't be fixed as always what do you think talk show nerd at gmail.com is the email address and we do have some listener feedback to get to I need someone to show me my place in all this. Robert Wendell writes, The problem, John, is when you want content from the genre so much that you're willing to overlook the direction, which doesn't add any value to the franchise. This won't get another season. There are thousands of years pre-Skywalker, like the Knights of Old Republic, they could adapt. But here we are, Messiah twin, witch twin sisters. It's just immersion breaking because they're inserting unbelievable agenda storylines into a nearly 50-year-old franchise. It's immersion breaking. It's Star Wars rings of power. So uh, first off, Robert, I disagree. These are not Messiah witch twin sisters. These were force created intentionally, thread created somehow, may not even be force created. We don't know that yet. We're still making an assumption. They may have used a different means. I'm guessing that it was thread or force. But again, intentional is different than the Immaculate Conception. And I happen to be, this is not going to come as a surprise, um, I really quite enjoyed Rings of Power. Now, this is coming from an individual that isn't widely familiar with the Lord of the Rings books, just based off the movies, but I personally really enjoyed uh, Rings of Power. 
Ray, but thank you for the comment. Uh, Ray2017 writes, we're all going to view this series and every other series and movie out of this franchise a lot differently. We all love Star Wars very differently, and I have different preferences of what makes the saga what it is and also what it could be. There are going to be some, like The Acolyte and The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, that will challenge some of us fans more than others. Um how it to uh, let's see more than more than others and not all of us will like how they turn out in terms of outcome and execution we're all a uh different community of star wars fans and that what's that and that's what makes us uh and the world go round and what makes us all of us unique in our differences now in terms of what the rest of the series is going gonna unfold i'm rather curious of seeing how the other half that was not <clears throat> showcased to the lucky few that saw all four episodes, how it all plays out and comes together. Thank you for another show. Looking forward to next week. And Black writes, I like this episode more than the first two, but still something is off about the series. It's most likely due to the fact that Lucasfilm cannot help themselves. They have to inject their worldview into just about every aspect of the show. It's too heavy handed. Like you said, it's turning me off. And if, uh, and if it did not have Star Wars attached to it, I wouldn't continue with it. But because I'm a lifelong Star Wars degenerate, I cannot bring myself to quit cold turkey with the franchise. God help me. Michael Tennant says, I really I wanted to like this show. I'm just not a fan of the direction it's going. Nothing makes sense. Star Wars, a Santa. Again, uh, a... Uh, podcaster or commentator that I would highly recommend you checking out on a YouTube without getting long winded. It was an eight out of 10 for me. I was captivated by the story and fully immersed, immersed in the episode, anxious and excited to see the rest of the story. I have so many questions after this episode. I'm looking forward to seeing the retelling of the story from another point of view. Uh, Ray 17 also adds this. I think for this episode and the next one coming, we're, going to be given um, a reminiscent callback to The Last Jedi. Different points of view will be telling the same if, uh, incident through um, of the same story through different eyes. Yeah, I don't think that that's going to be the case relating to, obviously, the conception of the of the twins, which is where everybody seems to be hung up. I think I talked about this on last week's show. If I, if I did, then I'm repeating myself, but I'm going to say it anyways because I don't remember. Somebody had made a comment to me, and it really stuck, and that is, it seems like with this show, they are they created it for the Star Wars fans that they want, not for the Star Wars fans that exist, and therein lies the the trouble. Like, they want to tear down and destroy in order to build back up, and in doing so, they're fine with alienating the core fan base of Star Wars. I do think there's going to be a course correction and that the Acolyte may have been the last really the last one to have this much agenda. I'm cautious for the Skeleton Crew since both of these shows were still created at a time when there was just a lot of agenda being injected into shows and we hadn't seen the negative feedback. And we've already seen changes with a lot of other content that is kind of returning to something we're, most, we're more used to seeing. Something more akin to what George did. He had political elements and social elements within the storytelling, but it was to the... It was to the benefit of the story. It wasn't the agenda driving the story. It was the story driving the story. Even though it had familiar themes in it, they weren't shoved in your face. Um, this was the biggest fear that I had of the Acolyte. It manifested itself in this first eight minutes. That being said, I've done two podcasts based off of one episode now, and I've been listening to a lot of commentary since it came out. So you tell me. You know, is it working? Is it not working? Are all these people that are complaining about the acolytes still going to be turning in to see, tuning in? You know, watching it to see how the whole thing plays out? Probably. The real question is how much long term damage was done, and unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I feel like there was a long, a lot of uh, long term uh, damage that's uh, been done in uh, in this show. So, um, I'm looking forward to. 
watching the next episode on uh, Wednesday, and I will share with you my thoughts on either Wednesday or Thursday uh, next week. If this, if this is one of your first times checking out the show, I hope that, and if you enjoy, to read, if you enjoy reading, boy, I'm really fumbling over my words. It's been a long morning. If you enjoy reading and clearly you like science fiction, I hope you'll check out my science fiction space opera series, Embark. You can follow a uh, ragtag squadron on a journey of survival after Earth faces its end and they fight for their future far from it. Treat yourself a friend or a family member with sci-fi. It is written for adults, but it's great for ages 11 and older. Seven books in all in the series, but pick up Embark Book One today. Available in Kindle Unlimited, ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. Just go to Amazon.com and search for John, J-O-N, John Justice, and Embark. If you like your science fiction, space opera to be epic with really cool technology, some romance and action, Embark is perfect for you. Thanks for checking out this episode. Again, I'll be back again uh, later on this week. I just had to get this out of my system. I hope wherever you are, you're happy, you're healthy, you're safe, and you're enjoying yourself some Star Wars. Ended up watching Attack of the Clones the other day. I quite like that film. It says a lot about my commentary on the show, but I had a really good time watching it. All right, I'll talk to you later on this week. Wherever you are, I hope you're happy, I hope you're healthy, I hope you're safe, and God bless. Bye. The Force will be with you. Always. My Nerd Road. <laughs> <laughs>